We might well ask, are there any new conclusions to be drawn from the life and work of a figure about whom so much has already been written? Since his death in 2005, at the age of 98, historians have parsed the myths Johnson cultivated for himself during his long life and gauged his actual impact on the development of modern and contemporary architecture. But two issues in particular continue to beleaguer historians, his homosexuality and his fascism. The extent of Johnson's fascist activities in the 1930s is well documented. Not only did he report on the early triumphs of the Nazi regime for the right-wing journal Social Justice, but he also resigned his position as the founding director of the Museum of Modern Art's Architecture Department to form his own fascist party in the United States with two like-minded friends, a move that genuinely shocked his friends in New York's high society. Many historians argue that Johnson distanced himself from politics beginning in the 1940s to rehabilitate his reputation and they have not found much in the way of political content in his work, although he seemingly embraced the dictates of corporate capitalism in his later postmodern projects. This raises several questions, which I would like to address with you this afternoon. First, what happened to Johnson's political passions after 1940? when at the age of 34 and with his life in ruins he abandoned political activism and enrolled at harvard university's graduate school of design second throughout the 1950s and 1960s johnson often spoke about his passion for history how did he deploy this passion in his architecture and writings and to what ends and third, we need a new way of thinking about Johnson's homosexuality in relationship to his architecture. How did he dramatize his ideas about beauty in the pavilions he built on his New Canaan estate and in his museum projects of the 50s and 60s? Were his aristocratic posturing and oppositional approach expressions of a vanguard camp? sensibility. So let's start with Johnson's passion for politics. I want to pick up with Johnson in 1945, when he returned to the Museum of Modern Art to organize a Mies van der Rohe retrospective, which took two years to complete and opened in September 1947. This was a passion project for Johnson with personal and ultimately, I believe, political significance. How so? It allowed him to sidestep the triumphalist rhetoric of the immediate post-war years and to return, intellectually at least, to pre-war Germany and to indulge his obsession with Prussian classicism and its legacy in Mises' work. Keep in mind that Mies himself had only arrived in Chicago in 1937, where he became the head of the architecture department at the Illinois Institute of Technology. And like the other German emigres, he wanted desperately to move beyond the troubled decade of the 1930s and his awkward attempts to win major commissions from the Nazi regime. Yet, Remarkably, these are precisely the projects Johnson highlighted in the exhibition. In the catalog, he lingers on the Kroller House and Bismarck Monument, two early projects inspired by Carl Friedrich Schinkel, emphasizing their pyramidal massing, the proportioning of their colonnades and attenuated fenestration all aspects that arguably prefigure 
Nazi prestige buildings. In fact, Johnson singled out Mises design for the Nazi Reichsbank competition, calling it the zenith of his early career and distilling from it a theory of radical historical synthesis, combining order and monumentality, the modern and the Baroque, that would become the basis for his own architecture in the 1950s and the 1960s. Even when presenting Mises' most recent projects, such as the library and administration building for the IIT campus in Chicago from 1943, Johnson completely bypassed its Midwestern American context and linked it back to Mises' Schinkel-inspired and Nazi-era designs. The retrospective proved to be highly influential, particularly among regional modernist architects who quickly adopted Miesian design principles. But I would suggest that it was, in essence, a means for Johnson to work through his unfulfilled adventure into fascist cultural politics. Now, the glass house realized only two years later in 1949 on his estate in New Canaan, Connecticut, was of a piece with the Mies retrospective. From its inception, it was more manifesto than dwelling, an architectural declaration of independence from the mainstream American cultural and political drives of the period. In 1950, Johnson described it as a utopia of absolute form and absolute shapes and positioned himself in a line of what he called intellectual revolutionaries from the Baroque. Among the 22 sources he cited as inspiration, he twice mentioned Schinkel's Casino at Klinica from 1826, which was the inspiration for Mises' Kroller House design. The Glass House makes a mockery of post-war American suburban mythology. That's partly the point. In Mr. Blanding's Builds His Dream House, Eric Hodgkin's uh, novel from 1946, New Canaan is depicted as a new Garden of Eden, where the neo-colonial house, outfitted with modern technological appliances, serves as an allegory for the integration of American revolutionary ideals into the post-war national security state. Marcel Breuer, who was Johnson's real-life neighbor in New Canaan, used shelter magazines to transform himself from an ideologically suspect European designer into a wholesome American architect. In numerous magazine profiles, Breuer translated Bauhaus principles into cheerful tips for the aspirational middle-class family and presented his own house in New Canaan as a model of modern suburban living. Johnson does the opposite by transforming himself from the son of an Ohio lawyer into a European libertine whose absolutist forms defy assimilation into democratic myth-making. In his public lectures, Johnson openly railed against mainstream mores. At an informal talk to students at Harvard in 1954, published as the Seven Crutches of Modern Architecture, he decried architecture driven by an economic motive, as well as the crutch of utility, of usefulness. By contrast, he championed the architect's act of creation and argued that architecture is, quote, man's will to power assuming visible form. Architecture is a veritable oratory of power made by form, unquote. This was a shocking statement for an American architect to make in the 1950s. For instance, 
when Architectural Forum profiled Connecticut General Life Insurance Company in 1954 in Bloomfield, Connecticut, it explicitly stressed that the architect renders himself almost invisible and explained how the building's form was shaped by the demands of the corporation to embody democratic values. As if in response, Johnson elevated his rhetoric in the, in the seven shibboleths of our profession, a speech he gave in 1962, he declared, the shibboleth of democratic capitalism can be a danger and decried the idea that our buildings be democratically access acceptable. The moon viewing pavilion, which he added to his New Canaan estate in 1962, was the architectural counterpart to these lectures. The pavilion was purposefully useless. It was a useless monument. In the essay he published about the pavilion, he described it as a folly in the tradition of aristocratic European garden architecture and connected it to 18th century philosophies of character and sensation in design. My pavilion is full scale, false scale, he explained. In these projects and their accompanying texts, he seems to have been calling attention to something false in post-war American culture. The notion that democratic capitalism could perpetuate or safeguard the great traditions of Western civilization. Johnson's passion for history. As his conduit to Schinkel and the tradition of Prussian classicism, Mies was at the heart of Johnson's worship of history. In Schinkel and Mies, a lecture he gave in the Congress Hall in West Berlin in 1961, he aligned himself with these two architects as the third in a trinity of romantic classicists. In this lecture, removed from an American context that inspired only his cynicism, he was at his most technical and reverent. In a dramatic and somber tone, he explained that all my architectural designing has been influenced by the work and example of two men, two men who both had years of their best work in this city, affirming that his desire to become an architect was the result of his earlier experiences in Berlin. Focusing his intellect on the two things he loved most, architecture and history, the twin figures of Schinkel and Mies emerged unaccented, he said, from the whole continuum of architecture. Johnson presents Schinkel and Mies as academic architects, although he argues they both grappled with the revolutionary work of their contemporaries, in Schinkel's case, Boulet, Gilles, and Ledoux, and in Mies's case, Lisitsky, Mondrian, and Picasso. But in championing their academicism, he actually made a case for his own eclecticism and historicism and distinguished himself from his own visionary contemporaries, notably Louis Kahn and Paul Rudolph. In his jewel box designs of the 50s and 60s, Johnson substituted the ideals of Prussian classicism and a romantic view of history for democratic values. His design for the Four Seasons restaurant in the Seagram building is a Schinkel-esque reimagining of an imperial Roman triclinium. A symbol of post-war elitism, it became the favored restaurant for New York's socialites, bankers, and publishing tycoons. The Eamon Carter Museum in Fort Worth, Texas, was an homage to Schinkel's Altus Museum in Berlin, while the Proctor Institute in Utica, New York, was an homage to Ledoux's Maison des Gardes Agricoles, which he had cited as a source for the glass house. The ceiling system in the lobby of the Sheldon Memorial Art Gallery in Lincoln, Nebraska, references Byzantine and Islamic architecture, while the bronze scissor stair recalls his admiration 
for the stare worthy of a Baroque palace in Mises' Nazi Reichsbank design. There is no humanist impulse in these buildings as there is in Kahn's architecture, for example. These buildings do not glorify the power of American materialism as do contemporaneous works by Eero Saarinen. There's no populist impulse in these buildings as there is in the architecture of Morris Lapidus or Edward Durrell Stone to appeal to middle-class fantasies of glamorous world travel. Johnson consistently forced a wedge between his buildings and American culture. When describing the Seagram building, for example, he linked a linked its beautiful stiff bronze edging and noble piers to the buildings of other golden ages, Egypt, Rome, Byzantium. By comparison, Lever House, designed by Skidmore Owings and Merrill, with its irregularly spaced aluminum clad columns was, as he described it, merely a devolution of the international style. But in truth, there was no ideological conflict between the ideals of democratic capitalism and the Seagram building, for example, which was very easily absorbed into pop culture. It plays the starring role in Jean Negalesco's movie, The Best of Everything, in which at climactic moments, the three young career girls at the center of the story look up at the Seagram building facade from the corner of Park Avenue and 52nd Street with Lever House in the distance as the embodiment of their dreams of upward mobility. And it plays a similar role in Breakfast at Tiffany's in which a kittenish Audrey Hepburn seduces George Pappard while sitting on the green marble balustrade framing the Seagram Building Plaza. If the Seagram Building seems aloof, it could be in the vein of elegance is refusal the Bon Mott Diane of Reland borrowed from Coco Chanel. In his talk at Kayam in 1959, Kahn described the building in fashionable terms when he called it uh, a co basically a coy, sophisticated lady. I can worry about the Seagram Tower, Kahn said. She is a beautiful bronze lady, but she is not true. Johnson construed in alternative historical context for his work. He self-consciously reignited an Enlightenment era debate about the relationship between antiquity and modernity, which he knew posited an irreconcilable gap between the past and the present. While his buildings were of course functional, behind them lay the same sublime encounter with history that informs Winkelmann's descriptions of ancient sculpture and Piranese's polemical prints. As a result, his architecture became the subject of extremely acidic critiques. Critics recognized the subversive, nihilistic undercurrent in his work, and many were appalled. They found Johnson's work frightening and even obscene. For example, in his 1973 book, Movements in Modern Architecture, Charles Jenks characterized Johnson's architecture as sheer sexual historical provocation, a demonstration of his impeccably perverse taste and motivated by historicist illusions. For Jenks, Johnson's architecture was not only amoral, but also fatalistic destructive of the public domain, which depends on both personal sacrifice and morality. More than two decades later, in a 1995 review of Franz Schultz's biography, Hilton Kramer characterized Johnson's career as a series of brilliantly performed charades in which other people's ideas, other people's taste, and other people's styles have been appropriated, exploited, deconstructed and repackaged to advance the prosperity of his own reputation and influence. This, by the way, is a good definition of a drag performance. 
Kramer dismissed all of Johnson's major works as failed buildings. Failure is, in fact, a productive lens through which to view the gay nature of Johnson's architecture. He transformed his failed political activism into a libertine aesthetic philosophy and cast a camp eye on dominant cultural and political myths to illuminate anxieties, particularly around issues of economy and usefulness and morality. His full-scale, false-scale architectural philosophy deliberately flaunted failure as a primary feature of, the, of his architecture. Queer theorists, including the literary critic Kevin Copelson, drawing on the work of Foucault, have stressed the significance of reverse discourse in gay self-articulation, defined as subaltern speech that transfigures dominant ideology. In other words, to translate the purposeful misappropriation of terminology or ideas in such a way that they are redirected at the dominant regime as a form of attack. And I would suggest that Johnson performs exactly this kind of reverse discourse in his architecture. So for example, about the moon viewing pavilion, he wrote, the form of the design, the grammar is frankly modern, but the idea of the arch is of course contrary to modern design. The point of the arches was, what, was that they were demonstrably false. It is obvious these arches are not structural, not honest, he wrote. And as he makes clear, I wanted to deliberately fly in the face of the modern tradition of functionalist architecture. He also clearly intended to challenge mainstream ideas about social utility. My pavilion I should wish to be compared to high style, high heel evening slippers, preferably satin, a pleasure giving object designed for beauty and the enhancement of human, preferably blonde beauty. It was a site not only of political, but also sexual and social inversion, purporting an idea of beauty at odds with the patriarchal ideals of corporate modernism. The digressive, witty performance style Johnson deployed in his lectures was indicative of a very distinctive, discursive mode Describing the backstage world of the performing arts in the 1950s and 1960s New York, headed at its apex by Johnson's close friend, Lincoln Kirsten, the poet Wayne Kostenbaum has described the paradoxical character on view in Johnson's writings. He is, and I'm quoting, the gay virtuoso gabber, creature of lists, parentheses, digressions, apostrophes, opinions, contradictions, all of which were part of pre-Stonewall gay argo. These are also key attributes of camp sensibility, which Susan Sontag described in her 1964 essay, Notes on Camp. Johnson's admission in full-scale, false-scale, that his pavilions were a joke on serious architecture, and yet serious architecture, aligns him with Sontag as a philosopher of camp, as does his recycling of architectural forms connected to vanquished regimes and dead styles of the past as bizarre fetish objects. Camp objects, as Sontag describes them, are analogous to the useless monuments Johnson designed, including the Roofless Church in New Harmony, Indiana from 1960, which some scholars have connected to Nazi architecture with its elaborate neoclassic romantic entrance gate. Johnson's cynicism was itself a kind of social gesture. With the rise of postmodernism, he knew enough to turn his cynicism into celebrity. In this, he was a trailblazer and a true contemporary of Andy Warhol. When postmodernism exploded in the 1970s, he was hailed as a prophet and rejuvenated his career. 
his grinning visage on the cover of Time in 1979, soon after the unveiling of his controversial AT&T building, represents the apotheosis of his cynicism and his histor historicism. By 1979, Johnson was no longer decrying the shibboleth of democratic capitalism, perhaps because big business no longer desired democratically acceptable buildings. It now aimed to express totalitarian fantasy. Was Johnson a patrician esthete, as the architect Peter Eisenman has said, or did his gay subjectivity, as woven into his various platform personas, as Robert Stern once called them, put him at a remove even from the elite class whose ideals he seemed to best express? Although he seems to have been the ultimate insider, was he in fact the ultimate outsider, like comparable figures such as Warhol and the British art historian Anthony Blunt? The comparison with Blunt, an icy gay esthete and specialist on Poussin, who hobnobbed with the British royal family but was a Soviet spy, may be a key to unlocking a deeper understanding of the complex processes of aesthetic idealization and erotic projection at the heart of Johnson's life and work. Thank you.